Uh, welcome into New York City and Riders Block. Happy Friday. I'm Bill Ryder. We've got a great show planned for you. Virginia's Kyle Guy is going to be on the show. Our own Todd Furman going to help you make some money. And we'll dive into the ugly mess that is the Antonio Brown saga from New York City starting right now. Let me preface all of this with, we've had A.B. on the show, was a great guy, maybe the best interview we've done, and I like the dude, but man, he has become radioactive in terms of everything he touches becomes remarkably problematic. Imagine being a Buffalo Bills fan, the anti-Christmas, you go to sleep last night, you've got Antonio Brown, you wake up in the morning, we're just kidding, he's not coming, because the report knocked down that he's going to be a Bill turns out to be, well, not true, in part because Antonio Brown himself didn't want to be in Buffalo. That's right, he doesn't want to be a Steeler. He's forcing his way out, but if you trade him to a place he doesn't want to be, maybe he's not going to show up. And we know this, not just because of the reports that are out there, but because Antonio Brown hasn't been afraid to express his candor about what he wants and what he expects to whatever teams he wants to be a part of himself, where most athletes do these days, on Instagram. If any NFL teams out there watching, hit my phone. Hit my phone. If one of them teams out there where the camaraderie bad, the energy bad, the players, haters, I don't want to play there. I don't want to go there. Hey, NFL teams, hit me up, but not you or you or you, and definitely not you, Buffalo. And A.B. went on to tell ESPN, quote, if they want me to play... They're going to play by my rules. If not, I don't need to play. Here's some breaking news for Antonio Brown. You're not in the NBA. You don't have this kind of power. And I really hope that you're serious when you say that you're willing to step away from the game and step away from all the money that would come with the next three or four years at a minimum of you being on the field for any NFL team, whether you want to be there or not, because it's a different paradigm, a different reality for athletes who play football for a living, those who play basketball. And so now that we've got this bizarre standoff, it reminds a lot of us, as my colleague Jason Lock and here on CBS Sports HQ pointed out, like another drama, like another level of dysfunction from another remarkably talented former Steeler, Le'Veon Bell. They're kind of having flashbacks to Le'Veon Bell. They want to trade him, and he's telling teams, I don't want to go anywhere. And they're like, well, wait a minute. You don't want to take our money, and these other teams are going to trade for you, are going to pay you when the season's over, so we don't get it. And it's kind of happening again. Like, okay, you want out. We're trying to get you out, and <laughs> you're making it almost impossible for us to get you out. JLC, JLC could not be more right. In fact, a year ago, more than a year ago, at last year's Super Bowl, I remember sitting down, for a 15-minute interview with Le'Veon Bell when it felt like he and the Steelers are probably going to figure out the second franchise tag slash new contract thing. And he told me, and I didn't believe him, and I'm sure he told other people while he made the rounds, that he would step away from the game. He'd sit out an entire year if he had to. Well, it turned out Le'Veon Bell wasn't bluffing. So I'm not going to make the same mistake with Antonio Brown. I'm not going to pretend that the most talented wide receiver of his generation is unwilling to step away from football and that he's bluffing. Who knows? So let's stick with the facts that we actually are aware of. A few refreshers on what it means for those teams that do get A-B, and certainly for the Steelers. Let's start with the cap reality, because this is, again, the National Football League, and the cap absolutely matters. He's due $2.5 million roster bonus on March 17th, obviously around the corner. If the Steelers trade their talented receiver before that date, they'd absorb about a $21.12 million um, amount in dead money on the salary cap. The amount jumps to almost $24 million if he's traded after March 17th, and if they trade him after June 1st, if this circus continues with him at least nominally a part of their organization, they can spread that amount over the course of several seasons. So whatever he's saying on Instagram, whatever's going on, whatever the deal is, there are some financial considerations that the Steelers are going to pay attention to as they try to figure out and maneuver how to get rid of Antonio Brown since he doesn't want to be there anymore. And let's just make it clear yet again, again, refresher part two, why we're doing this, why it's worth the drama, why teams like the Bills might have been involved for a time, because Antonio Brown is a ridiculously talented wide receiver, and whatever the problems in a locker room, they can be problematic on the field, he's a star. Since the 2013 season, 
He is first in a number of categories. You can see him there. Receptions, receiving yards, receiving touchdowns. He's third in receiving yards per game at just shy of 100 per game. Talent is the one thing in the world, in the NFL or anywhere else, that bends the rule, that changes the rules. If this guy were just a mediocre receiver, he'd already be retired playing golf or swimming on a beach or doing whatever retired former NFL players do. He's a marvelously talented dude. He is very well paid for a reason. And it only takes one, one single GM who decides, you know what? I can change him. I can make it work. It's worth the trouble. And Antonio Brown's going to find the landing spot that he wants. You may not like it. You may not think it's fair. You may think it's obnoxious. Kind of in that category. You sign a contract, you have a contract. Doesn't matter if one team decides, you know what? Whatever the price is, whatever the trouble is, I want that talent. I want that receiver to be part of my team. I do want to say this too, and I'm not in any way absolving Brown for being a diva and from being difficult and not living up to literally his obligations, his word on a piece of paper, his contract that he signed, but a lot of dysfunction coming out of this Steelers organization. And there's no doubt from the Le'Veon Bell thing to the Antonio Brown thing that there is culpability beyond each of those guys individually, even though they share it certainly for their own decision making. Ben Roethlisberger, well-known fact around the NFL, guys do not like him, they do not like playing with him. And when guys get paid, which Antonio Brown's gotten paid, when guys get egos, AB has an ego, and when guys think they're the most talented of all time, and AB told us that on this show a year ago, he's the greatest receiver ever, well, they're not gonna take it. So blame the Steelers organization, blame, blame Big Ben, who on the radio show, I might call Little Ben from time to time because I don't think he's much of a leader. Blame Antonio Brown, the truth is it's ugly, it's not gonna get better, but somebody somewhere is gonna decide that AB is worth the trouble because he's a hell of a talented wide receiver. And when that happens, when there's actual news, when there's a report that holds up, you will hear it first here on CBS Sports HQ because it's your home for streaming sports and we appreciate you. We got a lot of great interviews to get into. We're gonna visit with Todd Furman at the end of the show and Virginia's Kyle Guy gonna join me next here on the program, Writer's Block, and we continue next on your home for streaming sports. in the New York City and Riders Block. I'm Bill Ryder. Thank you so much for being here. Virginia men's basketball team, as you may know, is awesome this year. But not just defensively, they're offensively a force as well. One of the big reasons is Kyle Guy, and thrilled that he's joining me right now here on the show. All right, Kyle, thank you. Uh, but first of all, congrats on a successful season so far, and, and thanks for making time for us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right, so a win against Louisville this Saturday, and you guys lock up that number one seed headed into the ACC tournament. It's the only team you've lost to this season is Duke. How much is revenge or, you know, getting the best of these guys on your mind? Uh, I would think that as a team, we're really focused on one game at a time. So um, I think winning ACC regular season title is, is the number one thing in our mind right now and a goal that we set for ourselves at the beginning of the season, along with the uh, ACC Tournament Championship and the NCAA uh, Championship. So we lose to Duke two times, and we still accomplish all three of those goals, and it's a win for us. You and your teammates have consistently been a top-five team all year. It means you're going to get everybody's best shot every single night, every single game. You play elite ACC teams. How much does that benefit you and your teammates as you get ready for the goal that you're going to endeavor to uh, to make good on, to try to win an, NBA, an NCAA championship here in a few weeks? Yeah, absolutely. I think that it uh, holds us to a higher standard because we're getting everyone's best shot, like you said, and we have a target on our back. And that just allows us to play, uh, you know, with a, with a focus that, you know, most teams can't have for 40 minutes. And we are in 40-minute territory, so... Um, Coach preaches on that a lot, and we're just, you know, like I said, trying to be as focused as possible because we know we're getting everyone's best shot. You, you, you seem fairly surprised on Twitter that DeAndre Hunter wasn't a Naismith semi-finalist. Do you feel like, and there's a lot of programs out there, you guys are one of the one or two or three best in the country right now. What's your sense about whether or not Virginia's getting the respect as a basketball program and team that it deserves? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, DeAndre is one of the three best players in the country. Um, and, you know, there's nothing against any players that didn't make it. You know, got nothing but respect for their games and, and their programs. But um, I'm with DeAndre every day, and he's easily one of the best players I've ever played with. Um, but in terms of, you know, the credit that we get or don't get, I don't really care about that. And I don't think anyone on the team does. 
Um, I was just looking out for a fellow teammate that I, you know, think got wronged. And um, as a team and, and, and credit around the nation, we know in-house that we're one of the best teams in the country and, you know, we don't need anybody else's approval. Well, at least here in Riders Block, we, we, we know what's going on. And Parkers are paying attention in part because radio colleague Tiki Barber, proud Virginia grad, tells us about you guys, I, I swear to you, every single day so we're we're in the loop and tiki is making sure that we uh we know what's going on and he's also pointed out it's true coach bennett tony bennett has turned this program into an absolute powerhouse in a very very short amount of time in just a decade and it's hard to be consistently great in this sport at this level but virginia has done that can you give us some perspective maybe the uniqueness of of coach the methods the approach whatever it is that has created this level of consistency yeah, absolutely. He's one of the most genuine and transparent people, let alone coaches that I ever met. Um, it's one of the reasons I wanted to play for him is because I knew that he would make all of us better men than we were players, and that was, you know, very important to me and, and a lot of guys around us. So, um, you know, he will, he'll jump on your ass every once in a while, but for the most part, he's level-headed and he uh, treats everybody the same, very fair, um, but he expects uh, excellence, and, you know, we have our five pillars that we live by and play by, so. When people think of Virginia basketball, certainly the defense, and that's a critical way to win a championship in any sport, comes to mind. You guys are really dangerous offensively as well, too. As you look back at your time at Virginia, how much does this team, do you think, have some depth, have some weapons that maybe other teams in the past that you were part of weren't able to muster at the level you can this time around? Yeah, absolutely. We're shooting the, the three ball really well as a team. We're a very versatile team. Um, we play about eight or nine guys, but all those guys uh, are important and bring uh, a lot to the table in their minutes. So, um, you know, I'm just really proud of the way this team has progressed throughout the year and, and, and the way the coaching staff has handled, uh, you know, all of our roles. Kyle, take us into your world a, a little bit. Obviously, this is one of the best teams in the country. It's one of the best programs in the country. And you're, you're a captain. What does that mean for you? How has that experience been? What does that feel like in terms of not just the honor, but, but the responsibility? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, Jack Salt and, and Ty Jerome, who are the other captains, are some of the, the, the better leaders that I've been around, especially Jack Salt. He's a lead-by-example guy. Uh, Ty's very vocal, um, and I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. So, um, like I said, it's, a really, it's really just an honor because Coach just started doing captains last year, and, you know, we had great examples with Devin Hall, Isaiah, and Jack again. So, um, you know, just honored. And, you know, when I look back at 20 years when I'm done playing and I'm, you know, telling my kids and grandkids about what life was like playing for Coach Bennett, one of those things is that he trusted me to be a captain. Being a sports fan, competing in sports is obviously joyous moments, but there are some painful ones too. And you've been particularly candid about dealing with last year's loss to UMBC. How, how did that experience shape you and your team, you as a player, and why is this year going to be different? Yeah, the past two years we have um, made a lot of history, uh, both good and bad. And, and the greatest thing about this season is we've made history because no one's ever lost to a 16 seed. So that means no one's ever won after or lost after. So we have the best record ever after losing to a 16 seed. I think um, we, we keep that in the back of our mind that we did lose to them, but you know we're just trying to move on from it, never forget it. Um, helps us have a chip on our shoulder and stay focused every night, like I was saying earlier. All right, a few quick hits before, for you before we let you go, and really appreciate the time. Who's the guy on the team that spices up road trips the most, the best? Who's the funniest guy in that locker room? Um, probably Marco Anthony or DeAndre Hunter. Those two are – they're both reserves um, when they're, you know, out in public and stuff, but they're so funny and extroverted when they're around the team. So I'd have to give it to those two. All right, and who does uh, – you can tell us. We won't tell anybody other than everyone watching. Who does Coach get the most frustrated with in, in, in practice over the course of this season? Uh, probably Mamadi, uh, Dude Kite. He, um, he's one of the most athletic kids and has, you know, sky's the limit for his potential. But, you know, sometimes he has some mental lapses. And Coach, like I said, he expects excellence. So he'll jump on him every once in a while. But Mamadi's a fun-loving guy and, you know, he gets over quick. All right, last one. Can anyone on your team, any of your teammates, beat you on a good day, on a good day in the three-point contest? Um, no.
That's simple. <laughs> hey, we love the honesty. Congrats on the success. We hope it continues. And uh, thanks for making time for us. Appreciate it. Have a good one. All right, welcome back to the show. I like that answer. Nobody can beat me. That's the right answer. It's kind of an unfair question. Uh, Todd Furman, we're going to move on to him, our gambling guru, or one of them here at CBS Sports HQ. Furman is based in Vegas. He has his finger on the pulse of Sin City. And every now and then, most weeks, he gives us his perspective on how, hopefully, to make a little extra cash. Oh, he's going to join me here on the program in just a minute. Welcome back into New York City and Writer's Block. I'm your host, Bill Ryder. Thank you for being here. Earlier in the day, I had the chance to catch up with my buddy, Todd Furman, who broke my heart with some news I didn't want to hear, his perspective on the Cardinals, that and much more I thought was pretty interesting. I think you'll enjoy the conversation. Here it is. All right, Todd Furman, are you, gonna, you ready to make us some money, buddy? I'm always here to try and make some money, but Bill... These are really the dog days for sports bettors. It's that lull after the Super Bowl. Everybody's waiting with bated breath to see the field of 68. So what do we have to talk about? I mean, baseball? We're hitting baseball, buddy. And I got one. I got, I got, so on some of these awards, some of these futures, National League MVP. I'm scrolling through the list last night, and Corey Seager, 40-1, to 1, jumps off the page to me, coming off an injury that shouldn't affect, affect his bat was a top five MVP candidate his rookie year. Am I crazy or is, is, is there some value there? I don't think you're crazy at all. When you look at the National League and try and figure out how this landscape is going to play out, much different as far as the MVP race compared to the American League. I mean, Bryce Harper top the charts, but his price, not something that's going to get me running to the window. Nolan Arenado, well, we know he signed his big deal. Will he be as focused and engaged at 7-1? So a guy like Corey Seager makes a ton of sense. But a couple of sleepers for me on the same team, I'm high on the Nationals this year. And if the Nationals are going to try and make that ascent without Bryce Harper on their roster, I don't think they can rely on the youth of Juan Soto or maybe Victor Robles. This could be the time where Anthony Rendon rises to the occasion. Or we finally see Trey Turner, who people have talked about in fantasy circles as the second coming of I'm not sure who. And those guys, Rendon at 25-1, to one, Turner as a leadoff guy at 60-1. to one. They might be worth a few shekels themselves to try and throw their names into the discussion. All right, I like the trade, and I've I've been uh, I've been a part of that that siren song that is Trey Turner in fantasy sports. Yeah, the American League is a little more clustered. Is there anybody you see there if you were gonna put some money down, if you were in Vegas, if you just wanted some skin in the game that you like? Well, I think the craziest part about the American League is that you saw Mike Trout open as the favorite. That won't surprise anybody, but he's been bet down from that five to two, three to one range to even money. Essentially, that tells you that you can put up a dollar twenty and get every other player in the American League not named Mike Trout to win the MVP. And I think that speaks to his dominance and how many zeros he's going to get on that free agent contract in 2020 will be fun to watch. But as a Yankee fan, it's going to kill me to say this. If I'm looking for a long shot, so much gets lost in the Red Sox shuffle because Mookie Betts and J.D. Martinez get all the headlines. I think Andrew Benintendi is going to be that player to keep your eye on. 60 to 1. All his peripherals check out, and he is a superstar in waiting. You could do a lot worse than taking a bit of a flyer there. Furman, on the Cy Young Award side, whether it's the National League, the American League, or, or both, do you see any names that jump out to you that might be worth, again, some value or, or a long shot that you like? I'm a big fan of Aaron Nola. I think it's 7-1. to one. It's, You're not stealing anything, but he's got all the potential to be that ace in waiting, and I think this may be the year we finally see him take the next step. Uh, if you look further down the National League board, a pair of Cardinals pitchers, Miles Michaelis, we know he got the contract extension, and so much hype around Jack Flaherty. But if you really want a long shot in the National League, I saw a lot of Luis Castillo that I liked in the second half of last season for the Reds. Started sluggish, but has shown some of that ace-like potential. In the American League, I think the race is wide open. So I'll give you two long shots there. Mike Clevenger, can he step up and be the bona fide number two that the Indians need behind Corey Kluber? I still don't trust Trevor Bauer. And another Tampa Bay Ray. We saw Blake Snell burst onto the scene last year. Maybe this year it's Tyler Glass now. He's got the stuff to put up gaudy strikeout totals as long as he keeps the ball in the ballpark and he's got friendly confines to do that. Tyler Glass now could be a guy that we're talking about in September, October, replicating Blake Snell's feet a year ago. 
All right, well, as a Cubs fan, I hate to say this, but I love hearing you just mention Flaherty's name because in Jonah Carey's ridiculous football, baseball, basketball, three-way fantasy league, I've got Flaherty as a 42nd round keeper and the drafted 42nd round. It's going to be it's going to be two days of drafting next weekend. It's going to be lovely. All right, last one for you here, Todd. When you look at NL American League pennant, the teams that we think are going to be competing in the World Series in October in terms of value or just lines that have caught your eye, what are you looking at? For me, I'll give you my final four as it stands right now here in early March. I think we're talking about an NLCS between the St. Louis Cardinals, who I ultimately think dethrone your oh. Cubs atop the National League Central. And, Bill, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, and the Cubs may be on the outside looking in of even the Major League Baseball playoff picture unless they get that bullpen figured out. And I think they'll see the Dodgers in the National League Championship Series uh, yet again. We'll see if L.A. can finally get over the hump. And in the American League, I think we're talking chalk, chalk, and more chalk. The New York Yankees, assuming Luis Severino, it's only minor inflammation he's dealing with in his rotator cuff. And the Houston Astros, despite some questions in that starting staff, there's not a tougher lineup in the American League. I think it's Astros and Yankees vying for the American League pennant this year. Furman, I'm not one to bet against you because I've learned the, my lesson the hard way, but I've never truly wanted you to be more wrong than, than hearing you talk <laughs> about the Cardinals and Cubs. You're, you're the man. I just hope on this one you are swinging and missing. That hurts me, and it's March just to think about. Furman, great stuff, buddy. We'll do it, uh, we'll do it again next week. Always a pleasure, Billy. All right, that's everything from us. Thank you for being here. We're back on Monday. Tommy Tran taking over right now for the next 30 minutes. Going to catch up on what is trending in the world of sports. And then Keem Dermish has got you covered on Sportsline. Thank you for being here. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday.